It's a great pleasure to be invited here, Jens, and, and Angela and everybody have been very grateful and helpful with getting me here. This is a passion of mine for the last 20 years on the side. Other than being a spine surgeon, I think it's critically important that we pay attention to this now because I do think at some point it's going to affect reimbursement and things like even malpractice if you don't pay attention to bone health. So I'm going to give you a primer on it real quick here and tell you why this, why there, some of the things are important. There's my disclosures. Uh, we're going to look at normal bone physiology, abnormalities of bone physiology, such as vitamin D3 rickets and adult bone disturbances. This lady on the right came in and had kyphoplasties done, but you notice that her her sternum is buckling. Well, that's an automatic sign that, that uh, she's got some sort of severe metabolic bone disease. In this case, it was hyperparathyroidism that was missed. And her uh, HU scores were down in the 30s, 20s, and 30s, and her T scores were minus four. So it's a big deal. You know, so bone formation, you get enchondral bone formation. I think all the orthopedic surgeons know that, intermembranous formation. Um, and uh, the most important thing is to understand the integrity of the bone and the precise equilibrium that's maintained uh, at, between the osteoblast and osteoclast as you go through life. Your skeleton remodels about once every 10 years. And after the age of about 26 to 30, you can add no bone strength. You don't add calcium to your bone anymore. And it's a downward spiral, which is why, and that's because when you look at the cells within the marrow, they actually decrease after the age of 30. So you can't make bone as well, so you're always in a negative loss. And then women have osteoporosis that develops even worse. When they go through menopause, you lose 4% over five years, so you lose another quarter percent. So they, they get way ahead of the men who eventually catch up around age 80. We have an advantage because we have testosterone, so our bone's naturally more dense. And there are also racial differences in people that have different strengths of bone when you look at that. But the three things you really need to know about is TGF, BMPs, and, and parathyroid hormone. This is a primer. I show you why we, how we make bone, and I hope it's interesting for you. Uh, sorry for the neurosurgeons that might be on the, but, but if you do fusions, you gotta know this stuff, is there's a whole myriad of, of pathways that you have to understand. And, and the Kala A1 gene is the one that's responsible, a lot of people think, for having osteoporosis and everything. And um, defects in that lead to early osteoporosis. It appears to be genetic, familial, runs in families. And so when you make abnormal collagen, you make abnormal bone. And so uh, that's what a lot of people think. And, and once you make the collagen, uh, you, you really wind it up into a, a triple helix, as you see here. And you see all those little dots and proteins there and everything. Why are those important? Because every single one of those, somebody has found a defect in them that causes bone disease, specifically osteogenesis imperfecta. It all makes sense. There's 21 different types now, all based on genetic defects in those specific proteins, like the little PRB and the CTAP. So you go ahead and you wind it up and, 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 and uh, within the endoplasmic reticulum, and then you dump it out into the cytoplasm, as you see here, and it comes in, and here you go, you got CR tap and PLO2, and eventually it gets an extracellular matrix, and you notice BMP1. This is where BMP works. We've really elucidated that entire pathway of it, and it cuts the collagen down, and it has to be perfectly done to this point, or you have abnormal collagen, for example, you don't have any fibrillin form that leads to problems like Marfan's, okay? So once it gets out into the osteoclastic matrix, it automatically polymerizes. You get the uh, collagen making fibrils, and the fibrils basically would make a collagen fiber. And within that fiber, the bone is laid down. And so any defects along the pathway will lead to some sort of osteoporosis or something along this line. So where do we go next? You, you, once you get the collagen made, the bone analog, it's gonna fill in the matrix vesicles, which is an active metabolic process with calcium. And you're gonna have the osteoclast on one side remodeling bone and osteoblast making bone, very precisely controlled. And then out of that, the cell communication between those two cells is what makes us have good bone. Now this leads us to this. This is the cell, this is an, this is an osteoblast. Wow. And he's sitting there with a nice nucleus and everything. And this is how BMP works. It, it, it comes from other bone cells and it's released depending on what kind of bone requirements you need. And the SMAD proteins are important because they ask the side all the time on the boards. Those are intracellular membranes that kick on the nucleus and make you make more bone, more osteoblasts. WNT is also necessary. That makes more bone vascularization. Okay, so that has to be kicked on also, okay? So when you put that all together, you get more bone, more osteoblasts, okay? Cell stretch, you wonder what Wolf's Law is, why you remodel? Cellular stress on a bone cell makes it reproduce. So it stresses the endoplasmic reticulum, which is almost like a little framework in there, tells you to make more bone cells. So that's why we make good bone. And any interference with any of these things can make a difference. These things actually were delineated after we started using BMP.
Let's see if I can get this to go. So basic science, PTH stimulates both osteoblasts and osteoclasts, particularly osteoblasts. Okay, there's drugs called teriparatides, which replace the PTH, they're parathyroid analogs. PTH and teriparatides enhance BMP signaling, and that makes you make more bone and more osteoblasts, that makes more osteocytes, that makes more, and basically uh, produce more bone. So PTH stimulates bone remodeling and induces differentiated bone marrow, mesenchymal stromal cells, to make more bone cells, to make more bone. And on a cellular level, basically you just bind to the, to the BMP molecule. These receptor sites are right beside each other on the bone. So PTH, or teriparatide, enhances BMP if you've used it. So you get even more potentially robust healing and bone formation. Things you need to know. And they, and they basically uh, cause mesenchymal stem cells to differentiate an osteoblast. Very simple. Okay, PTH, and we replace them with teriparatides now, are internalized into the cell, make more bone cells to make better bone. Pretty simple, I think, I hope. Anyway, TGF-beta is often uh, promoted as a bone stimulant. What it really does, it stimulates the intercellular pathway to make more mesenchymal cells that are available for recruitment to make bone cells, okay? So you look at it here, and, and the same thing happens again. TGF-beta makes more mesenchymal cells, converts them to pre-osteoblasts and osteoblasts, and it works through the intercellular membranes into the cellular nucleus, causes proliferation. And then you, they basically with PTH and a teriparatide, they work synergistically together, more cells available for bone healing. So that makes sense? So you put it all together, okay, and you've got basically, you've got your BMP stimulating its receptor, causing you to produce more osteoblasts. You've got a WNT supporting structure to make more vascular support for the osteoblasts. You've got cellular stress from the fusion mass, for example, under pressure, like when you're walking, making more bone. Okay, all working through the, through the nucleus by stimulating cellular proliferation. Then you can take PTH and BMP and stimulate bone formation. Okay, and then finally you can take TGF-beta and facilitate more cells to convert to pre-osteoblasts. So now you all understand perfectly the physiology of bone production, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, real quick review there. So historical perspective of calcium and vitamin D, um, basically vitamin D was first identified a century ago and over the uh, beginning of the 19th century all the way up until McKinley uh, basically identified it prevented rickets and then it was named vitamin D by McCollum in 22. And then finally in 1929, uh, standard units were put into, into milk and what, whatnot to try to prevent rickets. Until then you had to take cod liver oil, which was high in D3. So when you look at this, basically, normally you'd use sunlight to make bone. But fortunately, here in Seattle, it, it looks like it rains about uh, 325 days a year. <laughs> so you don't get a lot of sunlight. So the bottom line, if you don't do that, you're not going to get an adequate vitamin D. And, and the vitamin D that's produced in the, in the skin goes to the liver. It's hydroxylated at the 25 position, hence why if you have any liver disease, you probably have vitamin D deficiency, okay? Goes back into circulation to the kidney, and if you have any kidney disease, it doesn't hydroxylate the one, the, the one hydroxylase, and hence you're probably gonna have vitamin D deficiency. Goes back, and then it regulates the bone and helps you reabsorb from the gut. So these all work together along with PTH to maintain calcium and vitamin D homeostasis. Again, very simple. But it's interesting, they ask a lot of this on our, on our board exams. Normal function, calcium is absolutely critical. It is very closely uh, regulated. If it goes up or down at any degree, you're gonna get into real problems and everything. And so it's responsible for all these things listed here, nerve conduction, hormonal balance. It's both intercellular and extracellular, and it's very tightly maintained. And the total body calcium is about 1.3 grams, of which 99.9% .9 is in the bone, and the rest circulates at about 10 milligrams per deciliter, both ionized and non-ionized uh, uh, for availability for use in the body. Now, supplemental vitamin D, the vital study just came out and said for normal people, you don't need to give it, only for people that have some sort of disease. They made a big deal about this and everything. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And it's probably true that a middle-aged person that's got normal vitamin D levels doesn't need to take supplemental vitamin D. But unfortunately, if you, the people I check in my office all have deficient vitamin D. And vitamin D helps produce insulin, it helps produce renin. It uh, basically is made also in the colon, prostate, and breast. And it functions both as a cellular regulator internally and externally. It's almost like hormonal. It's a very primitive kind of hormonal that's, uh, entity that's been along for, around for a long time in, in many different animals and everything. But the bottom line is that vitamin D is critical for us to get fusions and to have and to prevent fractures in people. And unfortunately, that's been ignored and we just pay attention to instrumentation. And if you don't fuse, your, your instrumentation will eventually fail.
So the classic cause of rickets is dietary, and if you look outside the United States, it is epidemic that people have severe vitamin D deficiency, mother and infants, Caucasian females, Afro-American females. It doesn't matter who you are, there's a pretty good chance your vitamin D level is going to be deficient. And we need to measure these in our patients, particularly women that are older, childbearing women, women that are pregnant, to make sure that it's above 20 milligrams and over 30 milligrams. Now, you all remember that when we had the pandemic, vitamin D was felt to be protective from COVID-19. That's probably not the case. It is protective against bacteria, specifically TB, because it actually enhances cytal effect of the macrophages. It kicks them on when your vitamin D levels are high, and it actually helps you fight tuberculosis, but unfortunately, it probably didn't help you fight COVID. You, you probably just needed to get the vaccine, I guess. <laughs> so we'll talk about the disease of bone, osteoporosis, is a bony condition that basically decrease in bone quantity and density and mass. Osteomalacia is a decrease in bone quality. In other words, your collagen sucks. It's not strong. It doesn't form good bone. A lot of times you'll see an alcoholic, some people along that line. A lot of people, you have to check for both. So what is the result in? If you have abnormal trabeculi from abnormal mineralization, you're going to basically get a fracture with, a very, with physiological loading and day-to-day -day activity like rolling over in bed. So that's why it's important to maintain good bone quality. And so throughout life, what we're going to try to do is to have more bone production than bone loss. And after the age of 30, that becomes really critically difficult for people. And that's why calcium and vitamin D are so necessary to both treat and, and uh, measure if you have a problem with the patients. So how do we measure it? Well, there's three real quick ways you can look at your patients before you, before you operate on them. I much emphasize that, and we're going to talk about that. If they've had a previous fragility fracture, like hip fracture, they've got osteoporosis, okay? If the DEXA scan shows that they've got less than two, they've got osteoporosis, 2.5. And of course, we now have, everybody gets CAT scans down at the cor corner Walgreens now. And the bottom line is we can always major HU because most of us order CAT scans before we operate. So take the time to do the ROI and you can tell pretty good. It's a very good surrogate like Ganesh talked about. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of spine surgeons use that all the time now. The FRAX score is great. You can download this and use it in your clinic. We do this with all the patients that come in, particularly ones for surgery. And it just simply has a quick questionnaire that will pretty much uh, tell you if you've got osteoporosis or not, and then you can justify getting your DEXA scan. The DEXA scan was already gone over. The bottom line is minus 2.5. Unless you're doing a single level or a disc herniation, if you're doing any complex adult reconstruction, you better beware. Because I, the, it's one of the major causes, along with mis worrying about alignment instead of balance, overcorrecting people, um, splitting the pedicles. There's just a, a myriad of, of reasons why, including neuro neurogenic disease like Parkinson's for failure of adult spinal deformity. But this is probably one of the biggest one and the most common one you'll see in people. So pay attention to the DEXA scan. Now there's a nice article um, um, uh, that we'll talk about in a second, but this is Dr. Nagata. Just, we just finished this uh, and got it published. We looked at children. Nobody's ever looked at children's HU units. And what do you think we found? We found after we measured, they, they're different. They have a vascular plexus back here you need to pay attention to, so you need to measure them a little bit more forward. But the most fascinating thing is we know that kids, children between 10 and 12, they, are, they tend to be osteoporotic when they have scoliosis. And here's what it looks like. So lo and behold, when we start looking at their HU scores, they become mildly osteopenic when they go through maturation during the growth spurt and everything. So this may be why some of these kids develop scoliosis. And so it, it, if you have an opportunistic CT scan and you're doing scoliosis, you might want to check it or get a DEXA scan to check those kids. Now, Patel wrote a really nice article. If you want to transfer these over, um, most people say between 100 to 120, you're probably osteoporotic if you're below that. Paul Anderson, who's a mentor of mine, who's really great with bone and is really a terrific guy, um, he says in his article, which was one of the review articles for our boards, is if it's less than 50, you shouldn't operate on the people, patient, if so, HUs. And I think that's probably pretty true, okay? So keep that in mind. So surgery should be avoided, a very good rule of thumb. So now we'll switch gears and we'll talk about classification. How do we treat this? Well, there's five major classes of treatment, bisphosphonates, SERMs, uh, which are for females only, by the way, they're estrogen modifiers. Denosumab, which blocks uh, osteoclast through the rankle inhibitor. Teriparatides, which are the only real anabolic ones to speak. And of course, the new one, Ramosizumab, which is a really fascinating drug. You don't have to remember any of the dosages of these, but uh, unfortunately, Denosumab is sub-Q, and uh, Ramosizumab is also injections once a month, and also the teriparatides are, are daily injections. How do they work? 
Well, simply put, they're either catabolic or they're anabolic, okay? So they're either going to stimulate bone production, such as a teriparatide or, uh, or a parathyroid hormone, and what, that, what that'll cause is a more production of osteoblasts, as I showed you with the basic science stuff that I uh, hope probably everybody's forgotten by now, but, but I hope you remember some of it. The other option is to slow down the resorption. That's classically what the bisphosphonates did. And of course, the one we use now um, is, is uh, um, nemosumab, which really just shuts down the osteoclast. They don't reabsorb bone, and you get a net production of bone. That's not very good, by the way. It tends to be very brittle, and that's why we have a lot of fractures. So these are the studies that say, show us why osteoporosis is important when we operate on people and why we need to pre-treat it preoperatively. When you look at preoperative vitamin D deficiency in spine fusions, look at these results here. Very high incidence that the patients you're opting on right now are deficient or less than 20. Look at the percentages here, 50, 30, 65%. In the incidence of osteoporosis in elective spine patients, you can see here is, is almost, is in the area of 40 to 60% and will have poor bone that you're operating on. Because we operate on an older population, people over 60 years old. Okay, there's been a lot of hysterectomies and oophorectomies done. There's been a lot of people that, that uh, smoke and, and drink and have poor bone metabolism. So 50% have poor bone health. So that's why you gotta be careful to check this pre-op. Kim in 2012 looked at patients and he even found that for whatever reason, the patients that had vitamin D deficiency also had low oswestry disability correl correlation. In other words, they, they seem to do worse, which makes sense because they didn't get good fusions or the screws got loose or some of the stuff that Ganesh went over earlier. So preoperative correction is essential and easy on these patients. Here's another study, here's a study by Ravonda, and what he found was, look at the odds ratio. If you're vitamin D deficiency, have vitamin D deficiency, your odds ratio of having a, a slower fusion is, is five, which is, which is really quite high. And the bottom line is fusion, time to fusion, is dependent on your vitamin D levels. Here's another, a second article by Ravonda, and, and it's very clear what it shows here, that if your vitamin D levels are low, less than 20, uh, you can see that the time diffusion is almost twice what it is if they're normal. This is the importance of treating this before surgery, why, why it's so important. Uh, Berjerky wrote a really nice paper and he talked about outcomes, mainly complications, and you can see that uh, about half the patients were osteopenic or osteoporotic in the study. And when you look at it, osteoporotic related complications were 50% if you had osteoporosis from having surgery, and non-unions were almost 50%. So why wouldn't you want to pay attention to this and, and treat it properly? Which I think really over the last five years, things have really kicked in and people are really are starting to treat vitamin D deficiency. As far as bisphosphonates effectiveness, there's a lot of studies predominantly out of, out of Japan where they can use teriparatides uh, uh, all the time. They're, they just prescribe them more frequently. But the bottom line is they do seem to have a delaying of the spine fusion, but ultimately the fusion rate is about the same in everything. So bisphosphonates are, are very useful for this. Um, as far as nemosumab, it also is beneficial. Uh, studies by uh, several people have shown that it doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to inhibit the fusion very much, but actually may help the fusion a little bit, particularly at six months. And um, weekly teriparatide seems to be more effective than using a bisphosphonate. It seems to have an earlier fusion because it, and they measure it basically by, you don't really see more bone mass per se, but you can follow the bone metabolism by these tracers here. And it shows that it, it really seems to increase the fusion uh, much more effectively than, than taking bisphosphonates, at least in the short term. And when they looked at postmenopausal women, pretty much the same thing. Um, um, they found that the women that had a teriparatide basically had earlier fusions and more robust fusions. And uh, the teriparatide group shows superior authority over the bisphosphonate. So they seem to be slightly better. The teriparatides have been clearly shown, at least in, by some people's thinking, to have better outcomes as far as treating these patients when you're doing fusions on them. And they basically have a bone healing uh, effect that, that tends to cut down on the screw loosening. The articles you need to look at are Arturus. He wrote three really nice articles with prospective randomized studies. And basically one said teriparatides improve fusion. They uh, improve internal fixation, is less screw loosening, and finally, that they are better than bisphosphonates in most cases. So, demosumab, sclerostosis is a disease you need to know. Brilliant work by one of the drug companies to make this. They look like this. They don't resorb bone. They just make bone, okay, because uh, they basically uh, have a sclerosin uh, inhibition. And so, if you could block this, if you, if you have sclerosin that stimulates the cell not to reabsorb, and everything, and if you could block that, it would turn on the osteocytes or osteoblasts to make more bone. And that's exactly what happened is they made an antibody, okay, that comes over here and blocks the sclerosin that's, 
put out by the osteocytes. And because of that, it allows osteoblastic proliferation and you basically make more bone, okay? And, and it's been used, uh, it, it's going to be probably extended to two years. They have trials running, but you can use it for a year and it makes uh, rather almost a 25% increase in bone. So how do we want to plan preoperatively? Basically, you have to identify the patients by putting all your patients on vitamin D, measure their levels, and, 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 to, and, and get some sort of score, either FRAX or preferably DEXA or, or HUs, and find out what happens. If they are osteoporotic, you need to delay surgery. Okay, if they're low risk, like you've got a herniated disc, they've got a neurological problem or something along that line, well, you can probably proceed to surgery okay. It, 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 you'll probably be okay. But anything more than two or three levels, you probably ought to think. So if you're doing something minimal, like a laminectomy, a cemented total hip arthroplasty, low bone mass, no more than two to three months, you'll probably be okay, unless it's an emergency situation with neurological compromise. If you've got to do two or three levels, something along that line, you probably ought to treat them for up to three to six months. And if you're doing a major reconstruction, it may take you up to a month, or rather a year, rather, to get those patients boned to where you can actually do something that won't result in a catastrophic PGAK or something. So primary treatment is the way to go, okay? So in conclusion about this, TGF-beta makes you more cells. BMPs convert those cells to osteoblasts, and PTH and teriparatides enhance that process. You want to treat your underlying bone problem, and you can use bisphosphonates, which most people tend to shy away from. They just use IV reclass or something along that line, which is bisphosphonate. Teriparatides and rosemat, I think, are the ones that are preferred. Okay, and bone quality, can you have problems at any age, as I just showed you in pediatric patients. You need to make sure that you understand, the first question you ask them is, do they have renal or kidney disease, rather, and if they have any liver problems. And after that, I think you really want to treat it and, and, and be on the lookout for some sort of bone problem if you're going to operate on them. So I'll just finish one way uh, with this real quickly about bone graft materials. You must get a fusion. You can put all the instrumentation in the world in there. It ain't going to work. So we really have these assortment of things we can use, BMP, autograft, a the ABMs and the P15 proteins, allograft, EBM, and PRP, which has fallen out of favor. You can either do osteoconductive, which provides a scaffolding, promotive, like the PRP stuff, or osteoinductive, which is the BMPs and actual autograft. So osteoconduction is just a scaffolding. There's a lot of products available out there. I don't think it matters which one you use. Just for what it's worth, tricalcium phosphate has been used since 1920 by Albi and was one of the first fusion materials used. So they've been around a long time. Osteoinduction, you have autograft, demineralized bone matrix, BMP, and the AMP15, some people think works like that. But keep this in mind, all the DB, DMBs that were tested by, uh, I'll show you a paper in a second, by Hugh Bay, have less than one millionth of a milligram of BMP. Yeah. Okay, one millionth of a milligram. Okay, so it's not even, they're not being dishonest when they say it's got BMP in it, it's just not clinically effective. <laughs> So um, AB, ABM is, uh, uh, P15 is, is a protein that, that basically allows, um, um, it's a residue that's a surfing substitute for autogenous bone that promotes bone formation. And a lot of people are using this now. It's, it's the um, kind of not like the Uncola 7-Up. It's like the UnBMP kind of product out there right now. And I'll leave it up to you as to what, whether or not you think it's effective. There's only, there are some prospective studies that says that's effectiveness. Allograft, um, basically, we all know it's basically just a scaffolding. You have to put some sort of induction protein with it. DBM, remember, is an allograft product. And, and remember that when Hugh Bay looked at it here in 2006, everything had a very low levels. So it doesn't matter, in my opinion, which one you use along, as long as they're sterile. <laughs> um, as far as bone grafting, gold uh, autograft remains the, the standard. It's tough nowadays because to get people to, to get a big hunk of their pelvis taken out. And so most people uh, 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 tend to use that. That fortunately came along with yours too, way back in 65, 65, half a century ago, identified BMP. And of course, he identified that it was in the glycoprotein and glycoglycan area of the bone. And, and basically, you put it into the muscle and you would form bone. And basically, he concluded that immediately following, uh, it will do bone autoinduction even if you put it in the muscle, hence the muscle pouch technique. So all the BMPs do, they take the mesenchymal cells, like I showed you on the cell membranes. This is before we identified that, and they make them into osteocytes. Hence, you make more bone. So what happened after that? We had BMP7 which is weaker, came along. And unfortunately, it didn't fuse very well because of the model they used, and it wasn't approved by the FDA, okay? So next, we had uh, basically BMP2, which we did at our center, which fused great. Here's what the fusion rates were, 
95%. But it was felt there were a lot of complications, particularly maybe there was a cancer risk, which certainly the study didn't show uh, statistically at all. But that led to the focusing of complications like somebody had mentioned earlier. And you get all these things, neuritis, seroma. Wherever you put that sponge, it's going to form bone. OK, like here. Here's an example of a guy that did try to do a T-lift, and he left the sponge in the, in the muscle, and it formed bone. <laughs> Okay, so if you put it in your eyeball or your quad muscle, but if you leave it around the nerve root when you do a T-lift and it's within one centimeter, which is how far it'll go, you're gonna get a problem. So that led to a study here that showed that you don't use it with cortical bone because it dissolves it. If you use it structurally like an ephemeral ring, it'll fail. People tend to ignore that. And a study came out uh, uh, later on that showed that for some reason uh, there was a lot of failure and not non-unions and some retrograde ejaculation. And unfortunately, it wasn't using it on label, it was using femoral allografts. Nobody noticed that. So then, of course, Kerji's paper came out and said BMP has a 10 to 50% complication rate, but unfortunately, so did the controls weren't actually sh had the same complication rate. So it was adjudicated by the Yoda study, said there might be more complications, but a better fusion. So Paul Anderson uh, came out and looked at a ton of uh, patients that were in the Medicare database and found that, guess what, there wasn't any difference in the, in the cancer rate. And then Steve Glass and my partner looked at all our T-lists and found that our neuritis rate, which was one of the big complaints because we didn't put it next to the nerve roots, we were using it posterior laterally, uh, was very low. And then uh, Tepper came along and he looked at quantitative semen analysis. Now, I have no idea. I would not want to be part of that study, quite honestly. But somehow he looked at it, and he determined that there was absolutely no difference because the questionnaires were kind of soft and bogus, and a, and a lot of men would say, yeah, I can't do anything. And, uh, but it turned out that when you did it really precisely, there was no increase in retrograde ejaculation. Hoffman came out and said it's great for, young, for older people. You get a better fusion rate. Uh, complications were uh, not particularly noticeable in quite a large series. Uh, Mickelson came out and had tons of ectopic bone formation. This came out of Belgium uh, because I think a lot of people use these products now for fusion. You can see all the ectopic bone, but they had no symptoms from it, it because it wasn't next to the nerve roots. It was around and everything else. Dennis Crandall, who was a T-lift master, he looked at all his patients. And what he, the most important thing he pointed out was the original LTK dose was four milligrams. Well, people were putting a whole large kit in a cage up front, which caused dissolution. So he clarified the fact that it's dose related. Meanwhile, concurrently, as far as what you're going to use for fusing people, um, because you have to use something that's osteoinductive, whether it's the A A5 protein or whatever, 15 protein. All these guys looked at all sorts of databases, no cancer risk. Um, JBGS came out and looked at a huge database uh, that we'll go by. But this is the stuff out of, um, out of um, um, uh, St. Louis. Look at the dose of BMP here that they were using for fusions, 115 milligrams. That must have been about $50,000 worth of stuff. But the bottom line is they just really didn't have any, see any complications. And they came back with another study, and they compared it to sear cancer rates, no increase in cancer. And so some of the better studies, uh, Malham came out of the Australian National Database with 100% capture. And he basically found that BMP provides a high fusion rate with no increased cancer rates. And uh, this is pretty much what, what, what they decided. And here's the cancers. Uh, melanoma, which really is excluded in the SEER analysis, uh, was probably the highest one in Australia kind of expected. So finally, JBS came out with a nice paper where they looked at, with some good PhDs that looked at it retrospectively, including some of the ones earlier. And they found that a large population was not associated with cancer, and it didn't introduce any new cancers, which was very nice. And Robbie Baines, OK, he, everybody knows Robbie. He works at. Uh, at the Kaiser, he looked at all the, which is another great database, he looked at all their people and there was no increase in cancer and their fusion rates were really good and their complication rates were, were fairly, fairly in line with what you saw with the other fusion products. And Cooper came back and he looked at it at a market scan and uh, found that with fusions, uh, there's no risk of cancer. And finally, uh, uh, Malham came back with the AO and said that basically um, get a good, that BMP, is really seems to fuse along with other products, allograft, and is superior. And finally, the one thing I want to finish with is it was a big drop off in it, and this article is kind of interesting. Uh, it's really come back if you look at the timeline here. This is as far as centers using, actually ordering products and everything. So what's the ideal bone graft? I can't tell you that because every one of you will use something different than I do. I can tell you that right now. I tend to use 
um, um, local bone graft for sure, and a lot of the products that, that we've talked about. What materials are available and what needs machining? Well, I can tell you the gold standard is if you have a single level posterior lateral fusion with instrumentation, you've got an 84% chance of getting a fusion. So all those studies that said they got those rates with a non instrument fusion were incorrect. Okay, so when you look at this, a ceramic provides osteoconductive uh, no, nothing else, okay? A ceramic plus cells has very weak osteoinductive capacity. Autograph, guess what? Has all three, which is why it's the best. DBM has very weak osteoinductive because the BMP levels are so low. Autograft, allograft has very weak because its BMP levels are very low. And BMP with a carrier has very strong osteoinductive. It doesn't matter which one of those carriers you use, by the way. So, the three components you need. You need osteoconductive, osteoprogenitor cells, or the stimulation of existing cells, or an osteoinductive proteins of some sort, whichever one you choose to use. And you put those all together, and you, you'll get the best bone graft or a super graft, okay? And that's where you're gonna get your best fusions, okay? So in conclusion, ultimately you must still select what type of bone grafting you think is best for your patient based on your reviews, and the integrity of the literature, which you need to review, which I've kind of tried to go over for you, and inform the the patient of their options and let them know, okay? And remember, instrumentation, whether you put two rods or four rods or five rods or six rods, if you do not fuse, eventually that instrumentation will fail. Yep. Thank you. Any questions? I don't know where to start. That was a, will be mandatory viewing for our incoming fellows and thank you for this incredible overview um, from ultrastructural science to clinical. Minutes. You did phenomenal. <laughs> um, we need to switch to Michael Wong in a second, but I have one big red hot button question and then we we'll want to come back to that later, maybe cancer risk in BMP. So in uh, patients with uh, cancer surgery, say metastatic spine surgery, um, can we use BMP or not based on what you know now? Um, I personally don't. Um, um, I, I still don't think that it's clarified in how it affects each and every one of the wide variety of cancers that we have, so I don't use it in those. Um, there have been a few patients that, uh, that I, I know some people use it frequently and they, they report no increase in, in the aggressiveness of the tumor. And so I, I think you need to be careful in using it in an existing tumor, in my personal opinion. Some yeah. people don't feel that way at all. Thank you, John. I want to come back to that later in your lab. Um, in the interest of time, let's switch to Miami quickly. I want to talk to you.